In the 10th century, the Chandela dynasty rose to power in the ancient land of Vatsa in central India. This region, later to be known as Bundelkhand, had a long history of temple building and art. It had witnessed the making of the Bharut Stupa with its sculpted railings in the 2nd century BC. Exquisite temples were made here at Diogar and Nachna in the 6th century in the Gupta period. In the 9th and 10th centuries, the Chandela dynasty was well established in this region and there was peace and prosperity. Art and culture flourished and the kings were great patrons of poetry and theatre. At their capital city of Khajuraho came the culmination of their cultural achievements. Here between the 10th and 12th centuries was created one of the most splendid temple cities in the history of the world. The temples of Khajuraho form a strikingly homogeneous group and were all made within a relatively short period of time. The concerted effort of making so many grand temples in one place speaks of the dynasty's desire to create a great center of worship and learning. By this time, the Indian temple form had fully developed. The entire temple was a manifestation of the deity in the inner sanctum or womb chamber. The devotee came here with the aspiration of self-transcendence, to look upon the deity within and to receive grace, to awaken the best within himself, eventually to realize the truth of the oneness of the whole of creation. As he circumambulated the temple, he was met by the images of the world around him, the world of forms which was familiar to him. Here he saw them in their true context, as all being but a manifestation of a single reality, which may be called divine. One of the things that most excites me about Indian sculpture is the sculpture that was made as part of the symbolically rich and incredibly powerful Indian temple form. It makes so much sense, each piece as making its own statement as part of the building, yet working together to create an entire vision of the cosmos and a vision of the expanding form of the god coming into the universe. And each little piece, much like the piece that is behind me, plays a role in that form. The massive platforms on which the temples are built are ornately carved with depictions of the life of the times. An interesting detail of men carrying a stone immortalizes the anonymous workers who built the temples. There is an exuberance of details in these panels which speaks of the vitality and prosperity of the times. Great armies, musicians and hunters march in an endless procession around the entire base of these temples. These moments frozen in stone are also valuable as they are the only visual record of society then. 
The response to the beauty of the world has always been regarded in Indian philosophy to be a stepping stone towards enlightenment. It has been believed that the perception of beauty is a view of the grace which underlies all of creation. Thus the depiction of beauty has always been a dominant theme for the Indian artist. Since earliest times, the auspicious figure of the woman has been one of the main vehicles for the communication of this grace. She has also symbolized the fertility of nature, which ensures the continuance of life. There is a profusion of depictions of women in every possible posture. They portray the rich abundance of nature and the joy of life. It is a celebration of woman in her myriad moods and moments. Writing a letter, applying coal to her eyes, drying her hair, playing with a ball, looking into a mirror, painting her feet, pulling out a thorn. Woman, innocent, coquettish, smiling, infinitely beautiful, depicted in a wealth of detail, sharply etched and chiseled with consummate skill. When one sees it as part of a building, as an integral part, one is reminded of the, um, the texts, the Shilpa Shastras, that uh, refer to um, the sculptures actually as a necessary part of the architectural um, accoutrements, decor. Without it, um, it would be like a, a woman without her jewellery, essentially. And um, the sculptures, whether they are the iconic figures um, in the shrines or whether they're the relief figures on the outside, all have a part to play. Um, I found uh, like the playful images of um, the works at Kajaraho to be quite extraordinary. I mean, when one thinks of the imagination of the designer, the creator, but also of the sculptors, um, it is amazing. By this period, the temple has become a complex form in which the numerous parts are seen in their relation to the whole. These fine sculptures are each beautiful in their own right. They are also all related and have their meaning in context of their each being a manifestation of the ultimate reality in the Garbhagreha or womb chamber within. What interests me most that has been some of my work is actually the period round about the 10th century in North India. And that's the time when the full range of images on the temple are being completely expressed. And when each location on the temple, be it on the wall of the exterior, on the tower, on the base, in the interior of the hall, comes to have a meaning that relates directly to its location within the temple body. And when that is first expressed, and expressed so clearly in the 10th century, that to me is extremely exciting. It's also the time in sculpture when there was, to me, something of a perfect balance between the needs of the image itself and the needs of the image as part of the architectural whole. Mithunas or loving couples are seen in Indian art since the first century AD in the Buddhist caves of Karle in Western India. In the early period, their being together in mutual affection is enough to represent the harmony of the natural order. As time progressed, the depictions of their coming together became more explicit. The desires and forces of human love 
are depicted as part of life in the world. Here, on the temple walls, the viewer sees them in their correct perspective, as only a reflection, like all else is, of the great reality which is to be met in the sanctum. When um, I think of this uh, particular piece, uh, and I think of Kajuraho, uh, we have um, the popular impression of um, a certain sort of erotic uh, element. So, but when one sees the male and the female coming together, um, there is there is um, that sort of the, often the sense of eroticism. I would say sensual, um, and but sensual in a devotional way, um, which is very different from sexual. And I think I would um, associate eroticism with um, sexuality. With um, and I don't see that in this. They, they, there is they're coming together as one, as more sort of in a. Um, in a sense of community, um, in a sense of grace. On the walls of the temple are depicted deities who provide a view of the knowledge which is within. They serve to give personalities to the divine, which is all pervasive and without form. Here, they are seen often with their spouses and with human qualities which we can relate to more easily. Myths and stories are made around the deities which capture the imagination of the devotee and explain the truth to him in many ways. Rearing leogryphs are an essential theme in Indic temples. We see here Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma, Indra, Agni, and the spouses of these deities. Celestials bearing garlands and offerings are made around them. The multifaceted walls of the temple provide a vast canvas for the depiction of these innumerable manifestations of the divine. The Lakshmana temple, completed by 945 AD, is one of the early structures at Kajuraho. It was built in the reign of King Yashovarman, who was also called Lakshavarman. He is known for having consolidated the Chandela Empire and also for establishing their tradition of temple building. The shikara of the temple is flanked by a number of smaller replicas of itself. These create a clustered effect similar to that of mountain peaks. Indic temples are often alluded to as great mountains. An inscription on the temple states that this temple rivals the peaks of the mountains of snow. In the plinth of the Lakshmana temple is the victorious celebration of Yashovarman's powerful armies. An inscription reads, He easily conquered the Kalinjara mountain, the dwelling place of Shiva, which is so high that it impedes the progress of the sun at midday. The celestial apsaras, naikas or beautiful women and divine figures made here have won universal admiration for their grace and charm. There is a sense of activity which fills the sculpture of this period. Yet, amidst all the movement, the faces are serene. The figures are made very three-dimensionally and are sculpted almost in the round. 
The effect of the sunlight and deep shadows fills these depictions with vitality. A fine quality of sandstone has been used here, which is very responsive to the chisel. The artists were able to capture minute details of ornamental jewellery and elaborately coiffured hair. Extolling the beauty of the Lakshmana temple, an inscription says, The inhabitants of heaven, when they meet together at festivals, are filled with increasing delight and are struck by wonder at the sight of this temple. Having completed a circumambulation of the temple, the devotee proceeds inside towards the knowledge which lies deep within. In the profusely ornamented Mahamandapa or hall, the beauty of Apsaras and other celestial beings welcomes the devotee on his journey. Windows are made high above. These provide a little light by which the exquisitely carved pillars and ceilings are seen. The ambulatory path surrounding the shrine is adorned with celestial attendants and representations of the many incarnations of Vishnu. In the sanctum, or Garbhagriha of the temple, resides the Lord Vishnu. The image is of Vishnu Chaturmurti, which is the form which was very popular in Kashmir then. Under a canopy in front of the temple stands a monolithic Varaha Avtara of Vishnu. Exquisitely finished, the Varaha has 674 figures carved on his body. The largest and most magnificent temple in Khajuraho is the Kandarya Mahadeva, dedicated to Lord Shiva. It was probably constructed by King Vidyadhara between 1017 and 1029. The towering Shikhara, with its subsidiary replicas clustered at varying heights, presents a grand analogy to Mount Kailasha, the abode of Lord Shiva. The temple is over a hundred feet tall. Its monumentality is in keeping with the trend in all parts of India at this time. The grandeur of the Lord and of the kings who worshipped him is also presented in the roughly contemporaneous Brihadeshwara temple in Tamil Nadu and the Lingaraja temple in Bhubaneswar. Adorning the Kandarya Mahadeva temple on all sides are celestial nymphs, Mithuna couples and many deities. Over 600 figures are carved on the exterior of the temple and more than 200 are made inside. Five kilometers from the village of Khajuraho is the southern group of temples. The Chatur Bhuj here is a magnificent temple of the beginning of the 12th century. The finely sculpted figures transport us to a realm of grace, providing an ordered view of the world around. Among the grandest monuments of Khajuraho is the 10th century temple of Parsavanatha. According to an inscription found here, this temple was built soon after the Lakshmana 
and its beautiful sculptures have a striking affinity to those of the Vaishnava temple. Their fine modeling, proportion and poise places the divine figures carved here among the finest to be found at Kajuraho. The numerous deities of the Hindu pantheon are represented here along with the Jena images. Next to the Parsavanatha stands the temple dedicated to the Jena Adinatha. This is a smaller temple of a later date, but it is most beautifully sculpted. The temple is girdled by three bands of sculptures, including some charming naikas. Here again, we see images of Hindu and Jena divinities. The teeming figures that fill these walls are made in accented postures, active in turning in myriad directions, seen from all sides, including from the back and in three-quarter profiles. These culminate the tendency towards the hardening of the facial features, elaboration of jewellery and a greater sense of activity which had been developing in the previous period. There is a profusion of Hindu deities which are made in the Jaina temples here and even as far away as the Buddhist temples of Nara in Japan. They constantly remind us of the traditions of Indic philosophical streams. In all these, the belief is in the unity of the whole of creation. In these, deities are personifications of the qualities within us. By meditating upon them, we awaken the best within. Thus, there are no barriers which separate the deities of the different streams of belief, all of which flow towards the same truth.